The next program in the series originates at Radio Moscow. The main thrust of our work is not to contact the space intellect, but to understand how the universe works. Good. Hello, this is Over the Edge, and uh, this is KPFA in Berkeley. Over Russia on another UFO tonight. And uh, we'll be here until 3 with this particular subject. almost forgot uh, there's a new release out by Negative Land called These Guys Are From England and Who Gives a Shh and uh, we could start by getting up in the air with this
1960. It's the height of the Cold War. It's the height of the Cold War. Gunsmoke is number one on TV. Back in California, the Lockheed Aircraft Corporation had set up a secret factory. New Rambler wagons are selling for $1,850, including tax and license. It was known as the Skunk Works. Eisenhower and Nixon are still a twosome. There, in less than a year, it had designed and built a revolutionary new reconnaissance aircraft. Lockheed Aircraft builds a special spy plane, the U-2. Even the Russians are marching to a pleasant beat. The U-2 took off on its first test. The plot? The CIA is overflying the Iron Curtain with secret aerial reconnaissance, dubbed the Black Lady of Espionage. It can reach altitudes never before touched. At these dizzying heights, it's thought to be invisible to Soviet radar, the ultimate spy in the sky. Within a year, the photographs taken from U-2 flights high above the Soviet Union would reveal that the bomber gap was a myth. The CIA recruits military pilots to fly these top-secret missions. They are supplied with a poison needle and a destruct switch. And told not to worry about being shot down because the Russians possess neither aircraft nor rocketry capable of reaching the U-2's altitude. More than 30 flights had been made over Soviet territory to hunt for ICBM launch sites. For almost four years, the U-2 had flown safely over sensitive Soviet targets. But I do say this, our defense, our defense is not only strong, it is awesome, and it is respected elsewhere. Eisenhower could not reveal to his critics the real reason for his confidence, the U-2 evidence. But the U-2 was about to become very public knowledge indeed. Then on May Day, 1960, the skies darkened. It was only days before a vital summit conference was due to take place in Paris. But the CIA believed that it had hard information about an ICBM launch site in northern Russia. Reluctantly, Eisenhower authorized the flight. Ike gambled and lost on one last flight. On May Day, 1960. On May 1st, 1960. Francis Gary Powers takes off from a Pakistani base. CIA pilot Gary Powers took off in an unmarked U-2 from a secret base in Pakistan. To fly over the heart of the Soviet Union. Halfway across Russia, the impossible happens. A supposedly invisible plane is shot out of the sky by a Soviet missile. An American spy plane is shot down over the Soviet Union. And the two world powers shake the earth with threats of war. When Khrushchev announced that a U.S. spy plane had been shot down by Soviet missiles, initially, the State Department tries to cover up. The administration claimed that the U-2 was a weather plane which had gone off course. Claiming the U-2 was a weather plane off course. It is entirely possible. Eisenhower goes along with the cover-up story because the State Department guarantees the spy plane is rigged to self-destruct and no one can bail out alive. Only then did the Russians reveal that the pilot had been captured alive. But when the Russians reveal the Powers is alive and their prisoner... On display in Moscow, the wreckage of pilot Francis Powers' U-2 reconnaissance plane for Moscovites and foreign newsmen to see. They have caught the President of the United States in a bald-faced lie. Even the CIA leaves Powers out in the cold. I saw how devastated Ike was by the U-2 affair. When it was over, it didn't affect the country's view of him. We still liked Ike. But the U-2 mess created a lot of problems. It was a bitter setback. deliberately sabotaged 
by our own national security establishment, specifically the CIA, in order to provoke a canceling of the summit conference. The CIA and the national security establishment did not want a rapprochement. They did not want detente between the Soviet Union and the United States. This mission, that is to say the U-2, flown by Francis Gary Powers, was deliberately sabotaged from the inside. The U-2 itself used a special uh, mixture of gases in order to be able to fly at that altitude, but there was no rocket engine, and this plane was supposedly down by a surface-to-air missile, nor was there any other jet aircraft in the world that could fly to this level because of the rarefied level of oxygen. Uh, in all probability, the mixture of gases for the engine of the U-2 was tampered with, and this starved the engine, forcing it to a lower level in order to get oxygen, and at this point, the plane may have been hit. Uh, Francis Gary Powers cites the information given to the Soviet Union by Lee Harvey Oswald as being the probable cause for the reason the Soviets were able to shoot down his U-2. Well, a lot of history could be blamed on one lone nut. Jam. It was necessary to research and find out the information that I was lacking. And there so must be something to it. Ethylene balloons, but according to the Air Force report. Rana. 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 I had a chance meeting with a Russian physicist, Nikolai Kapranov, a uh, Ph.D. physicist who had uh, had uh, been a national security advisor to the Russian parliament. He was here in the U.S. to uh, give a lecture on disarmament issues. I asked him about UFOs. He wasn't particularly interested, but he said he might be in a position to find people who knew about it if, in fact, there was such a program. We put him uh, basically on a retainer. He took seven months to, to locate the people who were in positions to know, and we went over there uh, when he had enough information to justify a trip. What we found is that much of what we suspect about the U.S. government is exactly what has been taking place in the Russian government. Long-term UFO studies by military agencies, long-term high-level interest in UFOs, not only by their military and KGB, but by their national scientific organizations. 
Groom Lake is one of those places where the Cold War was won. All manner of high-tech, super-secret military programs have been conducted there, presumably for the purposes of keeping our enemies at bay and keeping, uh, keeping us safe. But a funny thing happened after the Cold War was won. Instead of gearing down at Groom Lake, instead of relaxing the intense secrecy, instead of admitting the base even exists and that a good job was done by all, our military has taken the opposite approach. As we speak, the Pentagon has asked for additional secrecy. They want to seize another 4,000 acres of land around Groom Lake so that American citizens or anyone else can't look down and see what's going on in there. Which is ridiculous. The U.S. government has signed something called the Open Skies Treaty. It allows any other signatory nation to fly over Groom Lake anytime they want and take all the pictures they want. to get a bird's eye view of this base that doesn't exist. American citizens, however, cannot. Why not? To me, the message oozing out of Groom Lake is about as clear as it can get. It doesn't matter whether world conditions change. It doesn't matter whether the walls fall or democracy flourishes or capitalism explodes around the world. Things are going to remain the same here at home. Now we have another song by Tugu Bai Kazuko. It's called Rain. You'll hear the Nariste vocal and instrumental group. Secrecy mentality so ingrained in our military isn't going to change merely because we have no strategic enemy. They're not going to tell us diddly about secret planes or anything else. They got a $34 billion black budget and they want to maintain control over it for a variety of reasons. This realization is what initially inspired my interest in gaining access to whatever UFO information might be hidden in Russian files. Here's the premise. Agencies of the U.S. government have studied UFOs, they've spied on UFO researchers, they've infiltrated UFO organizations, they've withheld information, they've lied about their interest in UFOs, and they've disseminated disinformation for the purpose of muddying the UFO waters. Official files, their official files, indicate beyond any reasonable doubt that UFOs carry undeniable yet unclear national security implications. If it's true in the U.S., chances are it might be true in the USSR. Our guess was if a superpower like the U.S. had conducted these secret UFO studies, analyzed the data and photos in an attempt to figure out what it all means, the Russians probably did the same thing. Since it's become increasingly clear that our government isn't going to come clean on UFOs, we thought that Russia might. The ironic result would be we might learn more about what America knows about UFOs from the Russians than we'd ever learn from the Americans if you could follow that. Considering the new freedoms which were breaking out, perestroika, glasnost in Russia, we also thought it was a good time, perhaps the only time to take advantage of this window of opportunity. And we knew from the writings of people like Dr. Richard Haynes and Jacques Vallée and Antonio Honeas and Dr. Bruce Maccabee that there were solid indications of long-scale, long-term UFO studies in Russia. The trick was to get something solid, to contact first-hand witnesses, officials and scientists, and to bring it on home, and I think that's, that's what we did. What you'll hear tonight is testimony and evidence concerning some of the most important and controversial issues in American ufology, including crash saucers in Roswell. The Russians have a pretty good idea what went on there. Secret military UFO studies and files. They have theirs. They say we have ours. The incorporation of UFO information into military technology programs. They tried to do it. They say we did the same thing. Violent encounters between UFOs and military forces on both sides, as well as encounters in space between their astronauts, their cosmonauts, our astronauts. And the availability of scientifically verifiable evidence, including alleged UFO landing sites, soil samples, crop circles, and an unidentified material recovered from an alleged landing site. Any Western scientist who says there's nothing to study doesn't know what he's talking about. Those are some of the things we'll touch on tonight. Oh, my God. 
Most of my adult life, I was a career professional soldier. I uh, joined the Army in 1950, just in time for the Korean War. And I served a total of 27 years on active duty, and I retired as a command sergeant major, which is the highest enlisted rank you can have in the military service. And I'd always been kind of interested in the UFO matter. I'd been a kind of a curious skeptic, I suspect, best description. And I was interested in reading a little bit about it, and I had followed some of the information in the 50s. But I had never really been convinced of anything. And in 1963, I was assigned to Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers of Europe. And while I was at shape, I was there for almost five years. I learned of a study that had been initiated in 1961. And this study was brought about by the fact that during the 50s and early 60s, large circular metallic aircraft, strange design and shape and all, began to appear over Central Europe, coming out of the Soviet zone, flying over the Warsaw Pact, flying over the NATO area. Usually these objects would fly over toward England, and generally they would turn north over the English Channel, and they would dare disappear off of NATO radar over the Norwegian Sea. Well, these flyovers were getting to be rather a nuisance to, to both the military in, in the Soviet bloc area and in the NATO area. Because we found out for a long time that the Soviets thought they belonged to us, and for a time we actually thought they might have been Soviets. But after a while, it became apparent to both sides that these objects were not either one. But they demonstrated technology that was so far beyond anything we had, or the Soviets had. But it became quite apparent that they belonged to someone else. These circular objects would fly over Central Europe at a very high rate of speed, at a very high altitude, in formation, and they were almost always on in a, in a formation that was very clear that this was intelligent control. And uh, we'd send fighters up, and the Soviets would too. They made fools out of both of them. Well, this study in 61 was basically designed to determine what these objects were, who they belonged to, why they were there, what they were doing there, what it was all about. Well, the study was completed in 1964 while I was there. I served in shape from 1963 to 1967. And I was fortunate enough to have the highest security, military security classification you could have in NATO at that time, and that was Cosmic Top Secret. As such, I was assigned to the war room, which an area we call Shock, Supreme Headquarters Operations Center, and having a cosmic top secret clearance allowed me access to just about every classified document in the file. Well, when this study was completed in 64, it was immediately given a cosmic top secret level. And uh, it was an extremely sensitive document. And if, when I share with you some of the conclusions of it, it uh, you can understand why. The Universal Media Network presents another UFO. It is illustrating how people who have had hands-on, they've had their hands-on disc craft, they've had face-to-face -face encounters with non-human entities and they knew they were non-human, and they have been sworn by oath of secrecy, they have that go with them that there can be severe penalties if they would violate those oaths. 
yes. that they feel that it is important enough to get some of these experiences and some of this, of this information out to the few of us who are taking it seriously and trying to communicate to the general audience. And the fact that in this uh, military voices section, that there is a huge variety that ranges from uh, some people having the point of view that we're dealing with at least one type of intelligence that, quote, is neither benevolent nor neutral, which is an interesting phrase, to others who, by their very experiences, feel that we are dealing with an intelligence that is very concerned about our own environment and our self-destructive natures and that they themselves don't want this petri dish of the earth to be destroyed by us. musician Mihail Yermolayev. He was seriously heated as a composer just recently, after his concerto for viola and orchestra resounded at the Moscow Autumn Festival. This recording was made during the festival. The concerto was played by laureate of international competitions Yuri Bashmet and the Leningrad Chamber Music Orchestra. Find out for us what's in. To find out for us what's in. To find out for us what's in. To find out for us what's in. The KGB UFO Files. of unidentified flying objects. And suddenly the pilots shouted, look, film it. We looked and saw a triangle at a tremendous height. It was later estimated to have been flying at seven miles up. It was apparently enormous. Before a plane could scramble into the air to identify the object, it went behind a cloud and disappeared. They understood after the report to the government that they really took it seriously. I say seriously because the film was taken away. It was declared completely secret. The film was immediately locked up in KGB vaults and never seen by the public. That is, until we got a hold of it. It's still, I am told, the highest level of security access in NATO. Anyhow, when I first saw this thing in 1964, uh, I must be honest with you, it literally changed my life. Because for the first time in my life, I realized that all of these so-called fantasy objects, UFOs, were not science fiction at all. They were real. And uh, they were more than real, but implicated. Our correspondent spoke with the composer Mihail Yamalai. The concert was written by the musician Yuri Bashmet, a wonderful artist. Yuri Bashmet, an excellent viola player, asked me to compose the concerto. I worked on the music, keeping in mind his artistic ability and aesthetic demands. <laughs> Space was uh, not alone. 
apparently we've never been alone. When it was published in 64, uh, copy number one went to the Secretary General of NATO. Copy number two went to General Lyman Lemnitzer, who was my boss. He was the Supreme Allied Commander in Europe. He was a four-star United States Army General, very, very highly decorated, very fine man. Copy number three was put into the Shape War Room, a place we called Shock, and it was placed in the vault. And while I was on duty, and we pulled these duties in there from time to time, I would sometimes in the wee hours of the morning pull the thing out of the vault, sign it out, and go through it and read it. And uh, it got to the point that I really couldn't put it down because of the impact of it upon me. And the impact of it upon a lot of the top people in NATO is pretty overwhelming. The study basically concluded that... Uh, the human race and the planet Earth had indeed been under some kind of a survey or observation or study of some kind for a very long time. <clears throat> and this study or survey was evidently being conducted by several very high technology mixed with terrestrial intelligence. And they concluded that it had been going on for probably hundreds of years. Some people they even remarked that it could have been going on for thousands. For this, this threat, which they are concerned, were concerned with initially, was not a threat to military, military groups. Because if they, whoever they were, were hostile or malevolent, there was absolutely nothing we could do. But the, this is the realization that uh, most of the major governments of the planet and almost all of the military leadership on this have reached years and years ago. And it's, it's only a secret to most of the world's people. I mean, the authorities know it, but they've never shared the information with the common folk because this, they considered that this kind of information, these facts, this reality would probably be unsettling and unstabilizing and unnerving to the common person. Yermolaev received his professional training first and foremost as a pianist through music school, the conservatory, and postgraduate work. At present, he teaches at the Moscow Conservatory as an assistant in the piano class of Professor Vera Gornostaeva. As a pianist, he prefers the works of Bach and Beethoven and plays practically all of their piano compositions. We now know that the entire Soviet Armed Forces, a total of 15 million people over 10 years, was involved in a UFO study that turned up 40 major incidents, including one that prompted fears of accidental nuclear war. He began recordings for radio of Bach's cycle of 48 preludes and fugues. Here's one of them, played by Mikhail Yermolaev. A visit to Russia does not qualify as travel for the timid. There are a lot of stereotypical images that we've turned out over the, that turned out to be more or less accurate. Cold, gray, drab, snowy, slushy, muddy, windy, rainy, nasty, depressing, bad food, bad roads, bad service, worthless currency, rising crime, crooked cops, corrupt officials, spies under every bed, general paranoia, mosquitoes the size of Volvos, where men measure their back hair in bales and women wear napkins on their head, all true, more or less. Yet despite the tough times and dramatic changes which the Russians have undergone, we experience nothing but open hospitality and genuine warmth at every step. This is all the more amazing in light of what was happening during our visit. Massive civil unrest, daily demonstrations, and bombings and shootings, troops on the move, a constitutional crisis, and a pending impeachment. It was a heck of a time to be there if you're a journalist, whether you're following UFOs or whatever. Now, in order to give you an overview of what it was like and what we discovered, I'd like to show you an excerpt from one of the documentaries I've been working on. It's about an eight or nine minute segment which highlights some of the people and issues that we'll be covering in more depth tonight, if you can roll that first tape. But what do Russians know about UFOs? It was assumed by Western ufologists that the Soviets were experiencing the same type of UFO encounters as the rest of the world, but isolated incidents were all outsiders heard about. 
As tensions cooled and dialogue began between the East and West, the UFO issue was publicly breached. In a 1989 issue of the magazine Soviet Military Review, Russian military leaders argued in favor of an ongoing exchange of UFO information with the West. In the view of the authors, without such an exchange, a UFO might one day accidentally trigger a nuclear exchange between the superpowers on the assumption that the UFO was an enemy missile. The article acknowledged that UFOs were tracked by the defense systems of the USSR and applied that the same must be true in the U.S. Your work in the military is primarily boredom, interspersed with brief moments of pure terror. And that's exactly what it was like in the war room. We... The Universal Media Network presents another UFO. Yeah. We're looking at the Soviets in the Warsaw Pact across the divided Europe in those days. And God, we everybody had their fingers on the triggers and their thumbs poised above the red buttons. And I, it's no joke to tell you that World War III was only moments away. And uh, this UFO matter almost triggered that war at least a half a dozen times. Closed down a complete Minuteman facility up at, near Minot, North Dakota. And uh, I've gotten the full report because I've talked to some of the guys who were there. And what these people did, they hovered over the facility. They, they lifted the 20-ton door off of the silo. And then when the guys finally got into the missile, they found out that not only had the war had been melted, but they had scrambled the uh, guidance system to such a point that if the missile had ever been fired, God knows where it would have gone. Now, these guys have done this repeatedly. I say these guys, uh, whoever the hell they are. They did it to the Soviets, and they've done it to us. And uh, I tell you that in my view, that's probably why the Soviet Union exists no more. Things have happened that uh, they made a believer out of Gorbachev. They also made a believer out of Ronald Reagan. Uh, this incident in Minot, North Dakota, happened in 1982 when yeah, Reagan he, was in office. He was At first, we believed UFOs were something made by the Americans. But when we got reports that the Americans suspected us of the same thing, then we realized it was some unexplained phenomenon. An unexplained phenomenon seen as a possible threat to the Soviet Union. September 20th, 1977, at Reservoirs. Hundreds of people in the region report seeing a UFO shaped like a giant jellyfish. One artist painted what he saw. Levkin Billis, a scientist from Russia's top astronomical institute, collected eyewitness reports and used them to estimate the altitude and the trajectory of the UFO. It turned out that it was something like seven miles above the ground. It could not be a satellite polar lights, an aircraft, or a meteorite. I don't know what it could have been. The military could not explain Petra's events. That worried the leaders of the Soviet Union. What were these UFOs? Who sent them here? All of it could be true, meaning if we're dealing with multiple intelligences just like multiple uh, species of beings here humans on the earth that there appears to be bottom line mixed agendas mixed motives some seem to be highly supportive of helping us i believe as a species get beyond where we are others may not have any what we would call evil intent it may be that they are just the pragmatic uh, farmers of the universe and that they get and harvest genetic material from this planet or do a whole host of other things but that coming back to the government policy and their own stated interest in this training manual 
is that our government, more than anything else, wanted to study the craft and the technology that they were gaining and that they wanted to apply that information to American uh, military industrial uh, applications. That there are uh, a strong indications that there are communications between non-humans and our government over issues such as no nuclear war. And I go into that very uh, fascinating experience that Robert Salas uh, had when he was stationed at Malmstrom Air Force Base and back in the 1967 period where they had uh, approximately 10 Minuteman nuclear missiles in echo flight and November flight suddenly all go down as if they were linked and the uh, contractor who had built the Minuteman missile said that what happened was impossible. Well, Robert Dallas, uh, he had decided finally in after he's been retired from military career that he was so haunted by what had happened at Malmstrom Air Force Base that he decided with some other people to uh, file Freedom of Information Act requests about that date, which was uh, the March 16th, I believe it was, in 1967. Where? Yeah, this happened not just at one, once. This happened multiple times to different people, but Bob Salas was there underground about 80 feet below in the Minuteman uh, watch control facility when he gets a call from a security guard up above saying there is a red glowing disc-shaped object at the gate. Uh, they perceived it as a gate around this area at Malmstrom. Then I'm reading from a March 17, 1967 dated secret message from the Strategic Air Command SAC in Omaha, Nebraska the Air Material Center at Hill Air Force Base, Utah. They managed the Minuteman missiles back then. It says, quote, this is in its classified secret at the top, and then they had to scratch that out when they finally released it this past year to Robert Salas and, and his FOIA request. It says, secret message, all 10 missiles in echo flight at Malmstrom lost strategic alert within 10 seconds of each other and that was supposed to be an impossibility so this was a message from the standpoint of this red glowing pulsing object there that it had the ability to do that it had the ability to bring down our nuclear missiles and do it in such a way that the creators of them said it was impossible and eventually as we all know now we seized uh above ground nuclear testing uh we he's doing atmospheric testing and the world has moved away from what may have been a nuclear missile uh, exchange
зазвенит тебе навстречу. Ну, приезжай хоть на часу. That document, uh, to me, is one of the strong ones in terms of corroboration out of government files themselves that something so extraordinary as this occurred and that human engineers had no explanation. But the, the legacy of it was an impression that we were not going to be allowed somehow to have nuclear war or a nuclear exchange because maybe we would end up 
destroying things that could not be put back together. Shortly thereafter, Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev, in response to repeated statements by then-President Ronald Reagan, told Western reporters that he agreed with Reagan. If the world were ever threatened by outside powers, our two nations would stand side by side in the defense of Earth. Reagan alluded to this potential threat in five separate public speeches, including an address to the United Nations. I've often wondered, what if all of us in the world discovered that we were threatened by an outer a power from outer space, from another planet? Wouldn't we all of a sudden find that we didn't have any differences between us at all? We were all human beings, citizens of the world, and wouldn't we come together to fight? Well, to try to be brief, the document itself was about an inch and a half thick. It was supported by about six inches, perhaps maybe seven inches, of supporting uh, what we call annexes or appendices. And there were ten of them. And the annexes and appendices were fascinating because they dealt with everything from the art sciences to psychology, sociology, anthropology, ancient history, theology, and the conclusions basically that uh, we've not only never been alone, but uh, we probably in the future will begin, and begin to have some kind of a interrelationship with these advanced intelligences. <laughs> Не отрекаются, любя, не отрекаются, любя. Another UFO. And that was the part of it that I found so exciting. This is another UFO on Over the Edge, over Russia tonight. This is KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno. But over and over again, you find the statement that the, in, the intention to the government, even though classified as in the interest of national security to be kept away from the public and press while they studied technology, uh, the conclusions kept being that the intent seemed to not be hostile. And I think we should keep that in mind. Expeditions made very good arrangements of folk songs and studied ancient Russian music. He considers his diploma composition, the Second Symphony, as his most serious work. It was premiered two years ago at a concert featuring works by young Moscow composers. 
Here's a fragment of the Second Symphony, which was recorded at the time. In November 1977, a special meeting was convened at the Kremlin. Thirty-five people were present, top military brass, scientists, and government ministers. Meet the man chosen at that meeting to coordinate the military's research on UFOs, Colonel Boris Sokolov. I was coordinator at the Defense Ministry of Research in the field of anomalous phenomena in the atmosphere and in outer space. Sokolov says the military's interest was driven, again, by the Cold War. The Russians had observed that UFOs seemed able to fly at extraordinary speeds and to disappear from radar, even from sight, at will. It was presumed that if we obtained the knowledge of such technologies, we would achieve a considerable advantage in the competition in which we were unfortunately engaged at the time. The decision was made to conduct a gigantic study. All Soviet military personnel were ordered to report in depth about any sightings or contact with UFOs. Over a 10-year period, 15 million people told Moscow about everything unusual that they saw, photographed, or monitored on radar. No! October 4, 1982, Bielokorovice, Ukraine. Near a sleepy farming village, our search brought us to perhaps the most frightening case of all, an incident that could have started an accidental nuclear war. I was riding a motorcycle not far from here. I saw a large object in the air. It had a perfect geometric shape. Every person we spoke to in Bielokorovice said they saw a flying saucer on that day. They told us it was huge, about 900 feet in diameter. For hours, it hovered over the nearby ballistic missile base, where Lieutenant Colonel Vladimir Platunov worked as a missile engineer. It looked just like a flying saucer, the way they show them in the movies. No portholes, nothing. The surface was absolutely even. The disc made a beautiful turn like this, on the edge, just like a plane. There was no sound. I had never seen anything like that before. Lieutenant Colonel Platunov took me to the ruins of what was then a missile silo with a nuclear warhead pointed at the United States. It was dismantled three years ago under an arms reduction treaty. Platunov was in the bunker on that day 12 years ago. In this room were dual control panels for the missile, each hooked up to Moscow. What happened next so alarmed the Soviet military leadership that a four-man commission was sent the next day to investigate, including Colonel Sokolov. During this period, for a short time, signal lights on both the control panels suddenly turned on. The lights showing that missiles were preparing for launching, as could normally only happen if an order was transmitted from Moscow. No one had touched any buttons. No one had entered any codes. And yet, as the UFO hovered over the base, the control panel showed the missiles were preparing to launch. For 15 agonizing seconds, the base lost control of its nuclear weapons. What happened here on that day has never been explained. There were military exercises going on at the time of the incident involving the use of explosives in the air, but they were over 200 miles away. The weather conditions were normal, and when the commission ordered the control panels of the missile base taken apart piece by piece, nothing was found to be out of order. February 23, 1988, six years later, Kapustin Yar, near the Caspian Sea in southern Russia. It is Soviet Army and Navy Day, a national holiday. An unidentified flying object appears on the radar screen protecting the military base. As the UFO moves towards central Russia, the entire Soviet anti-ballistic missile radar grid goes on alert. 
Several times, fighter pilots are ordered to fire on the object. Each time, the pilot would report that as he prepared to fire, the target had disappeared. Finally, the UFO went away for good. Then Colonel Andre Varfolomeo, who was on duty that day, says the top brass decided not to file a report. Who needs to become notorious as the cuckoo commander? Some believe there are UFOs, others don't. But a commander does not need the headache. Со времен прекрасной Пенелопы Мы с вами читали гороскопы Да, 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 да Но горит, как правило, планеты Очень ненадежные советы Да, 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 да А у нас с тобою все в порядке Нам до гороскопов дела нет Мы друг друга любим без оглядки На расположение планет Мы с тобой по звездам не гадаем И, как говорится, совпадаем Да, 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 да True or false? Ну, а если кто любить не может Гороскоп им тоже не поможет Да, 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 да True or false? А у нас с тобою все в порядке Нам до гороскопов дела нет Мы друг друга любим без оглядки На расположение планет А у нас с тобою все в порядке Нам до гороскопов дела нет Мы друг друга любим без оглядки На расположение планет True or false? True or false? True or false? Mikhail Yermolayev became a member of the Union of Soviet Composers, a voluntary creative organization. As a composer, he plans to continue and develop in the traditions of Russian musical culture. Мне бы очень хотелось написать опер на современный сюжет. Я чувствую, что есть дом. I would like very much to write an opera on a modern theme, says Mikhail Yermolayev. I feel that we Soviet composers somewhat lag behind contemporary Soviet literature. The themes and problems raised by contemporary Soviet writers have not been reflected in music. However, I feel I'll be able to make my dream come true. Let's listen to a fragment from Mikhail Yermolayev's Concerto for Viola. threat. In November 1989, Soviet attitudes on UFOs became abundantly clear. The official news agency, TASS, reported on the alleged landing of an alien ship in the city of Verona. 
According to TASS, tall aliens and a robot exited the spaceship, walked around the park, and then left. The story was reported in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and on network news. None of these major media outlets had their own reporters on the scene, so most chose the approach they normally take with UFO stories. Earlier tonight, the CBS Evening News with Dan Rather included a report about the alleged alien landing at Voronish. Rather, Riley commented on the Soviet claims about 10-foot-tall aliens walking around a Russian park. The CBS newsman added, Don't believe everything you read in TASS. Within days, the Voronish story assumed almost surreal proportions. American headlines chortled about pinhead aliens. Follow-up stories claimed that the only witnesses to the landing were young children. And because the tall aliens described were different from the usual short, bug-eyed variety Americans hear about, it was smugly assumed the Russians must be wrong. So much superfluous information was added to media accounts that it took only a few days to generally discredit the entire event. Prominent astrophysicist Jacques Vallée was one of few Westerners to personally investigate the case by meeting with Russian sources firsthand. In Voronezh, there were many cases, not just the case that made the newspapers, not just the case that was re reported by TASS with the, 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 the school students. The witnesses were not just kids, they were 18, 19 year old kids, very articulate and obviously they had seen something, there were physical traces there, but there were many other cases, there are over a thousand witnesses in all in the city of Voronezh. Voronezh is a large city, it's over a million people. Uh, what they showed me was, uh, you know, the film, the physical evidence, they told me about the cases in which, for example, an object hovered near a, a nuclear power plant in Voronezh and a beam from that object melted the asphalt there. And that's what they are studying now. The story Americans read was much different from what the witnesses say happened at Voronezh. Inside the USSR, the incident helped unleash a long pent-up interest in the UFO topic, an interest that, by decree, had been dormant until Glasnost and Perestroika. Suddenly, Russians were flocking to newsstands to buy the same sort of UFO tabloids that Americans buy, filled with lurid, sensational stories about nasty aliens and their dubious intentions. At the same time, UFO organizations, including respected scientists and military officials, were free to openly discuss UFO cases and issues. But still, little was made public about what the Soviet government might know. In March 1993, our investigative team traveled to Moscow to meet with current and former government and military officials concerning UFO files. The journey was undertaken during a period of dramatic political and social upheaval in Russia, but few events could be as dramatic or as important as what was uncovered about UFOs and human knowledge of the alien presence. Russian physicist Nikolai Kapranov, a national security advisor to the Soviet parliament, spent months making the crucial contacts with sources who would not otherwise be available to Westerners, and who almost certainly would never have been accessible to Western journalists. Kapranov had heard rumblings about UFO studies over the years, but he was far from being a believer, that is, until he started asking questions of people in high places. More and more I started to think that this is something for real. <laughs> And uh, there are facts, and I've seen some materials one can't, you know, just just drop. What I learned about the UFO is that they're certainly for real, and uh, that the UFO is uh, one fragment of a very diverse and strong uh, phenomenon. The military people are looking at that very seriously. With Kapranov's assistance, our team succeeded in making contact with a previously hidden echelon of UFO researchers, dedicated scientists who had pursued their interest in alien visitors during the darkest days of communism, and whose findings have never before seen the light of day. A government biologist who analyzes soil samples from UFO landing sites. A Moscow professor who has secretly directed a discreet organization of high-level scientists and military personnel interested in UFOs. An author and physicist who began studying UFOs in the 50s and who became a non-person when he refused to quit talking and writing about the subject. 
an engineer in the Russian SDI program who asserts the Soviet military long ago determined that UFOs were interplanetary and who says UFO data has been incorporated into Russian beam weapon research. And a shadowy man who currently heads the ongoing Ministry of Defense study of UFOs and aliens. This man is Boris Sokolov, a retired Russian colonel from a distinguished military family. In 1978, Sokolov was given what seemed like an unusual assignment. Orders were handed down from the Ministry of Defense to every unit in the vast Soviet military empire. Every UFO sighting was to be fully investigated. All of these reports were to be funneled to Sokolov's command for analysis. First, an order was given to those pilots to chase the UFO and to shoot it. There were uh, 40 episodes like this, like that. Hundreds of Sokolov's most intriguing cases were compiled into this thick volume. Although much of the data is still being evaluated, it appears the Russians accumulated a mammoth amount of information about UFOs. The assumption that these craft were from somewhere else, perhaps outer space, became a foregone conclusion. The importance of these revelations is difficult to overstate. In Russia, of all places, a country still experimenting with democracy, it is now permissible for former military men and government scientists to admit a long-standing involvement in clandestine UFO research. In America, the cradle of freedom is another story. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for the tape. Uh, as mentioned, as mentioned, the, uh, the key to our success in Russia was Nikolai Kapranov. I met him uh, in Las Vegas. He was in the United States uh, uh, delivering lectures on disarmament issues at ver various universities, at Los Alamos Lab and things like that. When I first met him, uh, I was sort of disappointed. I knew that he had these high-level scientific and military contacts. Uh, but when we sat down over a beer to, to discuss it, he told me basically he had never thought about UFOs and had no interest in the subject. Then as we casually went along with the conversation, I asked him, well, you know anybody else? He, he starts dropping these names like, well, yeah, I do know this guy in the KGB who told me about UFOs one time. And I, I do know this, uh, this high-ranking military guy who's talked about it. And I said, basically, let's go for it. I mean, do you think you can get these people to talk about it? Uh, and he said, yeah, I can give it a try. He, Well, I worked the uh, Pacific area uh, with the Air Force where they had trouble in the field. And uh, as engineers, we would be handled troubled reports and try to work out the problems uh, that the Air Force ran into. We're a team that worked at Boeing. However, uh, in this particular case, uh, we got contacted by our representative in the Ogden Air Material Area. Told us that we give us heads up that we had a project coming in need to be looked at, and uh, I got the project. And it was the 10 missiles went down of an explanation. At the time, there was no mention of a UFO. Uh, we gathered a team together uh, and sent them out there. Now, uh, if after working that project for 12 years, uh, I knew pretty well how the system operates. And it's virtually impossible to knock off uh, 10 or a whole flight of missiles because of the redundancy. It's just not possible. It did happen. Now, they went on in uh, sequential fashion, but uh, it did happen. So we sent the team out, and the team investigated every possible thing that you can think of. So it told us that it was a very unusual event. Whatever knocked it down, there was no um, no failures, and nothing to uh, uh, blame the failure on. And so they continued the investigation for about a week or so. It came back, it came back in. And we were in the process of finalizing what we found, which is essentially nothing. And we got another call uh, from the Ogden Air Material Area, and they told us, cease and desist, do no further work, and do not submit a final report. Hmm. And that was it. Now, they're spending government money, and we were told to just shut down. That was it. Over the edge, raise you another UFO. 
What were the standing orders, if there were any, for the military, if they saw a, a UFO, a, a flying object that they could not identify as friend or foe? Were the orders to shoot it down or to let it go? There were orders to watch them until they presented a threat to the military. If there was such a threat, they were to be destroyed. March 2nd, 1991, Leningrad Airport. On the control tower balcony, air traffic controller Valery Rapitsky. I went out for a smoke. It was rather dark, and suddenly a very bright pulsating star caught my eye. I could see by its altitude that it was too low to be a star. It was some shining object, I told the guys. Then we looked at the radar screens and saw that it was hanging over Sosnovi Bor, where we have a nuclear power station. Look, guys, a UFO, a UFO. What the f These are the actual tapes made on that day. They've never been broadcast before. Listen to their voices. You can hear the excitement of the controllers about what they're seeing. Is it single or are there a few? Looks like a group. We have two or three spots now. The controllers have never seen anything like it. Look how fast it's moving. What is the speed? What is it? It's 3,154 kilometers per hour. That is almost 2,000 miles an hour. No plane known to man can travel at that speed from a dead stop. Forty miles away at the Sosnovi Bor nuclear power plant, workers run outside to gaze at what is hovering above them. What did you think when you saw it? That it was very beautiful. Top Russian scientists who have looked into UFOs tend to be skeptics. I showed astrophysicist Yuli Platov the film in Riga of the Silver Triangle. This one is a research a triangle-shaped French balloon. No doubt, absolutely. This is a balloon that can go to 18 miles up. The sides of the triangle are 150 feet each. The French government confirms such research balloons were in production by 1968, but we checked, and the only two said to have been launched in the region went up the month after the Riga UFO was seen. Throughout the Cold War, experts say over 95% of all UFO sightings in Russia can readily be explained as man-made, some of their own top-secret space and weapons research programs. Officially, for many years, this launching pad at Flosetsk didn't exist. And remember the 1977 Petrozavodsk UFO? Some experts believe it was really just a cloud of missile exhaust from a secret launch. Even skeptics, though, admit that some phenomena defy explanation. And every year, hundreds spend their summers camped out near places where UFOs have allegedly been seen, trying to photograph and otherwise monitor their activity. KPFA, KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno. Over the Edge brings you another UFO. Пожалей добра, терпимо будь, а 
значит будь добра храни меня и под своей рукою дай счастье мне значит дай покой Которая поет Пусть будет мой Остаток путь не дальний Не столько долгих Столько беспечальный И звереги Тепло Но, к сожалению, не поет. Дай на мне, где друзья, а где враги, И от морщин меня убереги. Не дай сестриться любимым телом, Не дай я тяжелее душой и телом. Мне, мне петь, Той женщине, которая не приведи судьба на склоне дней Мне пережить родных своих детей И если бед не избежать на свете Пошли их мне, 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 не денег, а мне Мне, той женщине, которая Не пожалей добра, терпимо будь, а значит, будь добра. Храни меня и под своей рукою, дай счастье мне, а значит, дай покоя. Дай счастье мне, дай счастье мне. Которая поет. We didn't want to go after those sources of information that were already known in the West. No professional ufologists. We didn't want to go after people who had already been quoted. We wanted another level of information. We didn't want people who just wanted to peddle stuff. So the people that you're going to hear from tonight were not out to sell their stories. We sought them out. We asked Nikolai to find people who would have been in a position to know about UFOs, find them and see what they know. And that's what he did. Perhaps the most important door that was open to us was the one which led to the modest apartment uh, shared by Colonel Boris Sokolov, a retired Red Army Colonel from a distinguished military family. You just heard from him a little bit. In the late 1970s, Sokolov was part of an elite handful of officers charged with adapting industrial technologies to military purposes. His area of concentration was radio waves and radio astronomy. As we'll learn, the Soviet military had long been monitoring UFO activity, but some spectacular sightings in the late 70s on the Russian-Finnish border prompted a more direct action. In, in 1978, a program was put into effect. In 1980, this amazing order was handed down by the Ministry of Defense. The order was issued to every military unit in the vast Soviet empire. 
Army, Navy, Air Force, everyone. In Sokolov's words, this order transformed the entire USSR into one gigantic UFO listening post. Simply put, the order stated that every UFO sighting, every UFO encounter, every unexplained aerial phenomena incident had to be fully investigated, witnesses interrogated, evidence assembled, and a complete was report was to be funneled at once to Sokolov's office. Find out for us what's in. Thousands of reports poured in because the study lasted a full 10 years. Sokolov is undoubtedly correct when he says that a collection effort of this magnitude can probably never be duplicated. The Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore. No more Soviet military empire. We can cue up the second tape here. Here is Colonel Sokolov speaking about some of the highlights from those reports and why this vast study was undertaken in the first place. The military was interested for three reasons. One, because of the unpredictable movement of the UFOs, the quick changes in course angles. Two, because of the velocity of the UFO movements. And three, because UFOs observed visually could not be seen on radar, and those seen on radar could not always be seen visually. The military thought that if the secrets of the UFOs could be discovered, they would be able to win the competition against our prospective enemies in terms of velocity, materials, and visibility. Stealth. To build their own stealth. Pilots recognized UFOs as a threat to them. There were 40 episodes in which they shot at UFOs. An order was given to pilots to chase UFOs and shoot at them. But when the pilots tried, the UFOs speeded up. In three cases, the pilots would lose control and crash. Two of the pilots died. After that, pilots received a new order. When they see a UFO, change course and get out. All the pilots agreed. October 5, 1983. I was ordered to immediately go to the Ukraine to an ICBM base. The reason for the urgency was a report from the base commander to the chief of the general staff. On October 4th, from 4 to 8 p.m., the base observed a UFO. At the same time, on the control panel, they received an order to prepare the launch of the ICBMs. The lights lit up, and the launch codes enabled the missiles. Dozens of officers witnessed this. That's good. A couple of key points about the what we just heard there. The Russians, in that... ICBM incident did not order the arming of the missiles October 5th 1983 the presumption by Sokolov and his team of investigators when they went to the Ukrainian base to investigate is that the UFO that was hovering over the base for four hours somehow did it it's a little bit reminiscent of the 1975 overflights on the US Canadian border where at five different bases over a couple of weeks UFOs appeared tinkered with the launch codes of, of our missiles as if to tell us something that uh, we can do whatever we want to with your most powerful weapons a couple of other points about Sokolov he said in addition to those 40 pilot encounters that we heard about there were dozens of incidents in which ground forces fired on UFOs in which UFOs caused car and plane engines to stall knocked out radios radars telephones clipped the wings of airplanes I've got some photos of that and immobilized personnel we also know from other published reports that the standing order not to fire on UFOs is still in effect. In 1991, the Russian air commander put it this way in the Russian press, why fire on something that may possess, quote, formidable capacities for retaliation? In other words, those UFOs may be able to kick our butts, why provoke them? Colonel Sokolov also added this somewhat cryptically. He said the Ministry of Defense study on UFOs is still going on, although on a lesser scale, and that, quote, unlike the one in the U.S., his study was passive. The Russians were not actively out there looking for UFOs. If one came along, Sokolov's orders were, get a full report on it. He said that was different from the United States. He says the Americans had built 30 tracking stations around the world for the express purpose of photographing and analyzing UFOs. Uh, this intelligence that they've been trying to keep out of the public and the press and they probably decided that it was in their best interest to just have you guys go away uh, that's correct now there were some other investigations done later on but they were not UFO related our representative later called me and told me about the incident that, hey yes 
that was reported a UFO was seen, and uh, consequently uh, the information came out to us who were on the inside, but it didn't go any further. Reminds me of my own brother's experience at Malmstrom 10 years later in October of 1975. He was so excited by what happened that he called me in Boston where I was doing uh, medical programming for Dr. Timothy Johnson at the ABC station there. And I remember the first excited words out of his mouth were, Linda, a UFO sat down on the face. And then he proceeded to tell me that he and uh, his uh, fellow colleagues had been at a wing party and beepers started going off all over the place. And he had uh, orders to get into a helicopter uh, to take certain uh, people out, going toward what was known as a Kilo uh, 7 missile place. It would be like one of these missiles uh, in the Echo and November flight, but now this is in 1975, not 1967. And as my brother was flying uh, some people toward this location, he was listening to the radio chatter and hearing the sabotage alert team was actually arguing with the command. Team was actually arguing with the command post and why the command post wanted the sabotage alert team to go forward and identify what it was that was setting off interrupt signals around the missile silo. In other words, that it, they had security and electronic security and it was being interrupted. And the sabotage alert team was reporting that what was over the missile silo, and this was their term, football field size, which is about 300 feet in diameter, fluorescent orange glowing disc uh, glowing brighter than daylight, only a few feet or yards above the top of the missile silo. My brother's listening to all this. And when they were ordered to approach and identify, they said, you want to come out and identify this, you come out. We aren't going any closer. And that was about a quarter of a mile from this object. And because there was this argument about it, apparently, and probably for other reasons, that jets were scrambled. My brother knew that, that jets were scrambled. When the jets got over the missile, the sabotage alert team on the ground said, my God, it has just disappeared. It has just popped out like you shut off the light. And if the jet overhead couldn't see anything and the sabotage alert team kept saying it has to be here nothing that big could have moved we didn't see it move but somehow it's made itself invisible the jets were pulled back and as soon as the jets were away the sabotage alert team reported that the huge orange fluorescent glowing thing popped right back into visibility over the missile silo and then began to rise vertically until it was about 200,000 feet and it doppled off the radar. It actually was picked up on radar. Well, this is where it really gets interesting. The next day, my brother knew what was happening around this. They went and checked the computer tape, the targeting information and the tape that would guide that missile and launch that missile. And they found that the targeting information on this tape had been altered very specifically altered and altered only in the targeting information. This is a feat that would be considered impossible. Um, I, I thought it would be almost like a joke uh, from another intelligence trying to get us to stop uh, this nuclear arsenal buildup if in fact the target had been changed to Washington, D.C. Uh, but I have not any idea. And then my brother said further, and after they found that the targeting information had selectively been altered, they took the entire missile out and they put a brand new one back in. So these were the things that were actually happening behind the scenes that never made headlines and were all associated with these large glowing discs.
noći joj ja pred domov slova Sad sem kročen ke je slova space intellect, but to understand how the universe works. they knew of four separate groups or they assumed there were four separate groups who were coming here there was there was a crash there was one crash that took place during the time the study was underway uh, a large 30 meter metallic circular disc crashed in northern Germany right near the Baltic Sea and at the time a British engineer battalion was the first military organization on the scene when the British got there, they found this 30-meter disc had kind of, well, sunk into the soil. It had not exploded or come apart. It it kind of halfway buried itself in the soft, sandy soil up there in that area. And uh, when they got inside of the thing, they found 12 small bodies. And that was all in one of the annexes on autopsy. Photographs of the little bodies 
photographs of them being taken out of the ship on stretchers, loaded upon ambulances. But the photographs were kind of sobering because uh, the little bodies were uh, rather small. They were about three and a half, four feet tall. And they were all absolutely identical. And some of the autopsy remarks that had been made by the medical examiners indicated that they didn't think they were a, a species or a race necessarily because they were all absolutely identical and they could not find any kind of reproductive capability or at least no kind of reproductive capability that we could recognize. And each and every one of these little guys was absolutely the same. So one of the remarks that I remember reading about is that one of the medical examiners concluded that, that maybe these guys were clones, maybe they were laboratory products, perhaps they were biological androids. Well, that was pretty heavy stuff back in 1964. Now, over the years since, it, it's not quite that amazing. I guess we've come to a point in our own science where we can practically do the same thing. But in 1964, it was a rather sobering kind of thing. He also admits that all of his UFO reports, the ones that went to his command, first had to go through the KGB attachments. There's a KGB attachment virtually in every military unit, at least there was, in the Soviet Empire. So he says that some of the more sensitive UFO reports that may have been compiled may not have ever made it to his desk. But the bottom line, he says, is that he saw probably more UFO information than anyone else in his country. I am indeed violating a, an oath that I took when I retired from the military. I'm violating an oath I took when I left SHAPE headquarters. I'm violating an oath I took when I left SHAPE headquarters in 1967. If you're familiar with military tradition, we, uh, we have to swear that we will never divulge at any time, at any place, ever some of the classified material we have access to during our military assignments. On this particular subject, I have indeed decided to violate that oath, and I've done it intentionally, on purpose, knowing full well that I'm taking a risk. This subject, with the implications for the planet and the human race, is so important. The people need to know, they've got to know, they have a right to know. Governments, I think, have a responsibility to share this. So yes, I am indeed taking a risk, and uh, I'm willing to do that. I'm 65 years old, I'm not going to be around that much longer. And I'm damned frustrated at it, because over the years I had kept thinking and hoping that governments around the planet would finally decide that they could trust their people enough to share this kind of information with them. And so far they haven't done it, although there are rumors that they're going to.
thousands of reports compiled during those ten years, Sokolov culled what he considers to be among the most interesting, a few hundred incidents. You saw that thick black binder there. Amazingly, we were able to obtain that entire file. It took several months, but we basically have all of those files translated now into English. I'd like to be able to tell you there are incredible, never-before-seen UFO experiences detailed in there, but that simply is not the case. Most of what was contained in the files would qualify as run-of-the-mill UFO encounters. A disc appears, car engines die, uh, radios conk out, witnesses get rattled and confused, that sort of thing. There are at least a few unusual reports, though, in the files. One was from a Russian army colonel who encountered a UFO while he was walking across a Moscow bridge. When the colonel tried to approach this disc, he says he was frozen by a beam of light. He blacked out. He woke up two hours later with no memory of what had occurred. Another incident during the summer of 1990 involved a mystery helicopter sim similar to what's been reported here. This mystery helicopter flew very low, made no noise, was piloted by two beings who appeared to be wearing masks and left behind a smell like fusing iron. A third document re referred cryptically to some unusual material recovered from a crash site. According to the document, the material was analyzed by four different scientific institutes they concluded this combination of alloys could not be made on Earth. Few other details, though, were available in the report we got. The real significance of the Ministry of Defense files is not in the specifics of the individual UFO incidents, but rather in the scope of the overall study. This was Russia's Pentagon, which had ordered this long-term, comprehensive UFO study for the express purpose of exploiting alien technology. They wanted to kick our butt on stealth. Pretty serious stuff. The idea that the Russians were studying UFOs in order to learn stealth technology was all more intriguing to me because of allegations concerning our own stealth program, allegations which have a direct bearing on some of the work I've done about things that may or may not be going on at Broom Lake in Nevada, claims that uh, people like Bob Lazar and other researchers have made about alien technology being incorporated into our own military programs. Tough stuff to prove that. But as Sokolov indicates, that was exactly why the Russians initiated this study in the first place. And he says that was their intention to accomplish. Various sources say there may be a connection between UFOs and the American Star Wars program. We were fortunate enough to find someone in Russia who makes that connection for their program. Through our contacts in the Russian Academy of Natural Science, we interviewed a man named Dr. Ramili Avramenko. He's the guy with the bushy eyebrows that you saw there briefly. He was, and perhaps still is, one of the chief scientists on Russia's anti-satellite weapons program, their SDI. He had the highest possible security clearances, so high that for much of his life, he hasn't even been able to use his real name. If he wanted to publish something in a scientific journal, he had to use an alias. Dr. Avramenko told us in no uncertain terms, UFOs are real. We and the Russians have known they are real for decades, and the information has been incorporated into SDI research. He even demonstrated, and if you'll roll this tape here, he even demonstrated a tabletop model of a plasma beam weapon for us. I think you saw a little glimpse of it in the earlier excerpt. It doesn't really come across all that great on tape as something really dramatic, but it was kind of impressive when we saw it in person. Uh, 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 well, Put this razor blade on top of this thing. There's no plugs or anything that we could see. And we, did, we were wondering what the heck this blue plastic contraption was on his desk. And he demonstrates it for us. And again, it's not all that dramatic and uh, uh, on tape, but in person, it uh, it blows a pretty good hole in this razor blade here instantaneously. It doesn't blow a hole in it, it burned it. Did that to show us that he actually was involved in plasma beam weapon research. And then he told us about his UFO experiences. The first time I saw UFOs was in 1959. I saw it with radar as it was orbiting Earth. In 1959, the first good radars were made. We could see several thousand kilometers. We could see what was happening around the Earth. At the time, satellites were easily countable. But we also saw vehicles whose technical characteristics we can't match even now. We saw tens of these in 1959, entering and leaving Earth's atmosphere. Surely the existence of these UFOs caused problems for the U.S. defense system. You were faced with separating aggressive vehicles from the unknowns. Are aliens and UFOs real? For me and my colleagues, that isn't even a question. 
I know this government has many programs on this. The information about UFOs helps us manufacture plasma beams for use in our Star Wars. The weapons of the aliens, we call them. That's good. Dr. Avramenko did make a couple of other startling pronouncements. He told us that uh, about a massive UFO over Hanoi during the Vietnam War, every weapon in that city was trained on it, and it did nothing. He says that defense computers on both sides, the Russians and ours, have now been programmed to weed out UFOs of an, or anomalous objects. They don't even register on these computers, and to separate, they separate the unknowns from man-made objects, which might help now explain how our government can say our satellites don't detect UFOs, and they can say it with a straight face. He also made a, something of a slip, and he said the only thing which can approach the speed of UFOs is the American Aurora, which is being flown in Nevada. I pressed him about this. Hey, what? Whoa, what did you just say? Aurora? And then he backs up and hems and hauls and goes, well, I only know about that from the popular press. Both Sokolov and Avramenko told us that military studies of UFOs are still underway in Russia. And with the help of Nikolai Kapranov, our guide, the physicist, we met the man who's currently in charge of the ongoing study. By agreement, we're not able to give you his name. Um, we had several meetings with him, and in addition to the files we obtained from Colonel Sokolov, we managed to get copies of these still classified documents about the ongoing UFO studies from this man. What the documents reveal is this ongoing, high-level, dead serious interest in UFOs by the Russian military. In the documents, there are numerous references to American ufology, and it's clear that they are monitoring developments around the world. Things such as MJ-12 are mentioned prominently in these documents. Now, this does not mean that MJ-12 is real or that the Russians believe it to be real. It merely means they're keeping up with the things that we're debating about on the subject of ufology. Я говорю нет, но это условный рефлекс Наверное, слишком поздно Слишком поздно Ты можешь спросить себя, где мой новый красивый дом Ты можешь цитировать Брайана Ина с Дэвидом Бирном Но в любой коммунальной квартире есть свой собственный цирк Шаги в сапогах в абсолютно пустом коридоре И ты вел им все дальше и дальше Но чем дальше в лес, тем легче целиться в спину И ты приходил домой с сердцем полным любви И мы разбивали его вместе, каждый последний раз вместе Наши руки привыкли к пластмассе Наши руки боятся держать серебро Но кто сказал, что мы не можем стать чище? Кто сказал, что мы не можем стать чище?
один раз закрыл глаза. Я прошу за воду, вода очисти нас еще один раз закрыл глаза. Я прошу за воду, вода очисти нас еще один раз закрыв глаза. Я прошу за воду, вода очисти нас. Radio Moscow presents another program in the series. This is a rare case. This is another UFO over Russia tonight. KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno. Even more clear, though, is that they are far beyond the question of UFO reality. That's not a matter of discussion anymore. Many UFOs are misidentifications. They acknowledge that. But the Russians are focusing more on, on things such as how these things work and how they can duplicate the technology. The name of this ongoing study is Thread 3. One of the more enlightening sections of the papers of the Thread 3 documents we obtained contains a, a detailed account of UFO sightings by Soviet cosmonauts. We've often wondered what American astronauts have really seen while they've been up there. A lot of rumors and stories that the American astronauts just won't talk about. Well, Russian space encounters with UFOs were reported from the very beginning. Yuri Gagarin himself. Gagarin is quoted in these documents as saying, UFOs are real, they fly at incredible speeds, He's seen them, and he'd tell more about what he'd seen if he was given permission to do so. 
The second Russian in space, cosmonaut Titov, he took along a film camera. He photographed a small fleet of these white balls zipping around and over and under his uh, space capsule. I saw one of these frames of film. It's very intriguing. Also in the classified documents, information about American UFO encounters in space, including several references to things seen on the moon by American astronauts. Then um, took place during this uh, stay, and um, I can find out exactly when it was. I can give you the date. It was in March 1991. March 1991, and uh, they filmed a Soviet spaceship coming up and docking um, at the Mir space station. When in the distance um, they saw a cigar-shaped thing hovering there, and. Um, of course, Musa Manarov, who originally had the mission to film the docking, um, concentrated on this cigar-shaped thing and filmed it for several minutes. And uh, in the film, you um, even see something like a rotating light going around this cigar-shaped craft. And um, oh, Musa Manarov, in an interview he gave us, um, confirmed but he took the film, but for him uh, the object is still unexplainable, and that at least it was bigger than the docking um, Soviet craft. Of course, in space you can't see distances because you don't have an atmosphere. You don't know if an object is a couple of, of uh, a meters away or a couple of, of miles away, yes. um, but um, he believes it was rather a bigger object, and uh, he was very confused by what he filmed, and the film was released already in 1995 at the UFO conference in Germany. And the material which was brought out by Giorgio Bonzovani, by our Italian colleague Giorgio Bonzovani, who also has some very, very good connections to Russia, and who got some fascinating films taken by the Russian cosmonauts Volkov and Krikalov in August of 1991, and um, films taken in November 1995 when a docking of the space, uh, uh, space shuttle and uh, Mir, the Mir space station, um, was filmed and uh, broadcast to the um, ground control in Moscow. And on this film you see several luminous objects maneuvering around the Mir space station, and some of them definitely under intelligent control. And it was just live broadcast to the ground control uh, center in Moscow. Several years ago, I broke personally two very large stories. Wrote them on CNN and on NBC. Those two stories were the, the Soviet Phobos 1 and 2, uh, the Phobos 2 encounter in Mars orbit with a 15 and a half mile long object that apparently destroyed it. And we got the photograph from the Russians, ran it in, in the magazine, showed it on national TV, and the STS-48 shuttle encounter in 1991 that in live video showed an object rising from the limb of the earth traveling across the screen suddenly making a violent 145 degree right angle turn shoot out into space a microsecond before something appeared to fire at it crossing the exact point in space where the object had just been just missing it. now I mean m literally millions of people around the world saw those two stories, saw me talking about those two stories, and then virtually from straight media, total silence. Well, let me say this to you. It wasn't lost on me. I followed up on STS-48. I ended up doing quite an investigation, getting more footage and looking into it further. And I think you were right on the money with that one. I think we have to face the fact uh, we all probably looked at the uh, Robertson panel documents, which were originally top secret, the CIA panel of 1953, that states, the conclusion dealing with this subject shall be 
not to inform the public about it, A, and B, to treat it with ridicule if it comes out. <clears throat> yes. And about how this information was removed from NASA's public files. They think it happened, and they think the reason we haven't returned to the moon is because we were told not to return to the moon. Whether or not that's true, that's what they believe. At least that's what's written in their official documents. Now, this is still going on today, and there are people who are masquerading as media, appearing on television shows, and ridiculing people and, and demeaning them. Well, obviously, the Robertson panel, which was over 40 years ago... Accomplished its mission. It's so not we, just accomplished it. Whatever we, the conclusions were, still govern the dealing with this subject in media. Now, there are many, many uh, media sources... Sam, I hate to have to stop you there, but... Alexander Zetsepin wrote this music for the joint. He said, what beautiful music, just the thing for our picture. is a 38-year-old composer from the Soviet Republic of the Ukraine. Another UFO. He's known as a composer of symphonic and chamber music compositions. The largest form among them are his second and third symphonies. Now, these works are devoted to historical events in the Ukraine and the Soviet Union as a whole. The Socialist Revolution of 1917. The war against Hitlerite fascism. Evgeny Stankovic feels that such events should be reflected in music since they depict most vividly the best characteristics of the people, patriotism, humanism, and the love of freedom. Here's a fragment from Evgeny Stankovic's second symphony, which the author has entitled Heroic. We know the Russians are studying UFOs now. We know they've studied the subject at least since the late 70s, but how far back does it go? One man could answer these questions. We were able to find him. His name is Dr. Valery Budakov. Dr. Budakov has been mentioned in a few articles here in the West. Most of those references have been based on a single interview he gave to a Russian newspaper, but to our knowledge, no Western journalist had ever talked to him before we did, at least not on tape. You can roll this now. I'm pleased to share with you some of what he had to say about some of the biggest questions, specifically Roswell. Budakov worked for a man named Sergei Korolov, the father of Russian rocketry. Korolov told me that in 1948 he was invited to the Kremlin to see Stalin. This was after the events in New Mexico and after the death of Captain Mantell. Stalin brought Korolov into a room where all the materials were spread on a table. Western periodicals, books, articles, UFO reports from the Soviet Union, information from special channels in the U.S. Stalin wanted to know, what did Korolov think about the material concerning Roswell and UFOs? Korolov asked to take the materials home to study them and was told, no, he had to work there. When Korolov finished the work, Stalin asked him again his opinion. Korolov said, the phenomenon is real. They do not appear to be dangerous to our country. They are not manufactured in the States or any other country. And the time will come when it must be further studied. Stalin thanked him and said the same opinion was shared by other specialists. We know that the U.S. Air Force possesses plenty of material about UFOs. We know the U.S. Navy also has plenty of material. 
We know about special orders given to keep all of the material secret. When curious people ask for the materials, they are told they're not there. For the near future, the most interesting materials will be kept secret. The owners of the material don't let it out. Sorting fable from fact. Sorting fable from fact. Sorting fable from fact has undoubtedly been a problem to man since he first began to speak. It's almost like uh, an intelligence playing a game with us to make points. Uh, that for some reason can't be done in some kind of straightforward dialogue that we all want. Everything seems to be symbolic and metaphorical. I have a quote from a retired U.S. military officer that was said to me in 1991, and this person wanted to remain anonymous, but his quote is so uh, germane to everything we've been talking about. He said, quote, The alien technology is so advanced. And the beings are so strange that no one would believe it. Keeping the public and media away from what's really happening is not difficult. It's a story that no one wants to tell, that no one knows how to tell. The truth is stranger than fiction, unquote. Мне нравится, что вы больны не боли. Мне нравится, что я больна не вами, Что никогда тяжелый шар земной Не уплывет под нашими ногами. Мне нравится, что можно быть смешной, распущенной, И не играть словами, И не краснеть удушливой волной, Слегка соприкоснувшись рукавами. Спасибо вам и сердцем, и рукой За то, что вы меня, не зная, сами так любите. За мой ночной покой, За редкой встречи, за капными часами, За наше негуляние под луной, За солнце и у нас над головами, За то, что вы больны, Увы, не мной, За то, что я, увы, Больна не вами. Wrote his second symphony in 1975, when the Soviet Union was festively marking the 30th anniversary of victory over Hitlerite fascism. This was not the first time the composer used this theme. It's evident in the music he wrote to the film Fiery Path which is about the liberation of the Ukraine from the Hitlerite invaders. The film depicts the heroism and bravery of the Soviet soldiers, scenes of cruel destruction throughout the Republic, including the Transcarpathians, the mountainous region in western Ukraine where Yevgeny Stankovich was born. The film was hailed by Soviet audiences and the expressive music was noted. Yevgeny Stankovich's second symphony is a continuation of the theme depicting the struggle against fascism. Here's a fragment from the symphony, A Glorious Requiem, in memory of the fallen.
That's good. Dr. Budakov says that he and other top scientists in subsequent years, including Felix Ziegel and others, were asked to give these high-level, behind-the-scenes briefings on UFOs to the KGB, to defense officials at atomic installations, and other secret research institutes. Many of these briefings, the, the important point being, many of these briefings were being given at a time when it was illegal to discuss UFOs in public. You couldn't print anything about it because the communists frowned on it. They regarded it as some sort of a capitalistic plot, at least in public. Behind the scenes, though, it was another story. Budakov finally, as you heard, says that he's certain the U.S. possesses vast amounts of UFO material. He specified the Air Force and the Navy has this stuff. I couldn't get him to be more specific about what's in it or how he knows, uh, but that's where it stands. American debunkers like Jim Oberg and Phil Klass have provided air cover for those scientists who simply don't want to study UFOs by poo-pooing the entire subject without the benefit of research. They give ammo to scientists who want to claim that they don't study UFOs because there's nothing to study. I mean, it's nothing but an ethereal or ephemeral kind of a thing that's in the air. Poof, it's gone. In 1976, a year after he wrote the Second Symphony, Yevgeny Stankovich composed his Third Symphony, a large work unusual in theme and execution. The symphony is called Affirmation and was written to the poetry of Pavel Tichina, one of the founders of Soviet Ukrainian poetry. The latter confirms the poet's oneness with the people and his part in the fate of his country at various times in its history. The six-part cycle is performed by symphony orchestra, chorus, and a soloist. The symphony merited a Republican state prize. The work was played in Moscow and recorded by the national recording firm Melodia. Now, the third movement of Yevgeny Stankovich's Third Symphony. It's based on a poem about one's love for the homeland. in this country believe in the power of faith healers, signs of the zodiac, ghosts. During three years of living in Moscow, I've learned that people here are more willing than Americans to suspend disbelief. Scientific proof isn't everything. There is a mystical side to the Russian soul.
кто, к сожалению, не поет. Дай знак мне, где друзья, а где враги, и от морщин меня убереги. Не дай сиситься любимым телом, не дай я сиситься душой и телом мне. которая поет. Не выведи судьба на склоне дней Мне пережить родных своих детей. И если бед не избежать на свете, Пошли их мне, 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 не дядя, мне. Той женщине, которая... Не пожалей добра, терпимо будь, а значит, будь добра. Храни меня и под своей рукой дай счастье мне, а значит, дай покоя, дай счастье мне, дай счастье мне. Many people tell me they are convinced not only that life exists elsewhere in this universe, but that our Earth is being visited. When I started working on this in 1978, I was a 100% skeptic. Now I'm 90%. I mean, there are some phenomena that just cannot be explained.
уральским утром выйду слишком рано. Вчерашний вечер остается смутным. В конце концов, зачем об этом думать? Найдется кто-то, кто мне все расскажет. Горст жемчуга в ладу. Вот путь, который я оставлю тайной. Благодарю тебя за этот дар. Умение спать и видеть сны. Сны о чем-то большем. Сны о чем-то большем. Сны о чем-то большем. Когда наступит время оправданий, Что я скажу тебе, Что я не видел смысла делать плохо, И я не видел шансов сделать лучше. Видимо, что-то прошло мимо, И я не знаю, как мне сказать об этом. Недаром в доме все зеркала с глины, Чтобы с утра не разглядеть глаза. Снов о чем-то большем, Снов о чем-то большем. Снов о чем-то большем.
that position is quite simply wrong. I had the opportunity to meet with Russia's premier UFO skeptic, a scientist named Yuri Platov. He works at something called the Institute for Terrestrial Magnetism, part of their Academy of Sciences. Dr. Platov, who is a friend, or at least a colleague of Jim Oberg, by the way, informed us of the official history of UFO studies in Russia. He said their National Academy of Sciences, the premier scientific body in Russia, had began formal studies of UFOs back in the 1970s. That ten different scientific institutions are involved. That thousands of case files have been compiled along with photos and drawings. If we could roll the tape here, I'll show you a couple of those photos and drawings. And he says there is general agreement among Russian scientists that the topic is worthy of study. Platov describes himself, unlike Oberg, as a friendly skeptic. By that, he agrees that well over 90% of UFOs cataloged by the Academy are explainable. Again, I remind you of Jim Oberg's comments. The Russians can't distinguish truth from reality. This guy tells me that the Academy knows that 90% of the uh, cases that have been cataloged by them are perfectly explainable. However, he says in order to identify a new phenomenon, you have to proceed with identifying that which is not new. He fully admits that many cases are not explainable, and he does not rule out the possibility of extraterrestrial visitations. Some of the photos that we were able to bring back are quite good. This is a drawing of one that he says is explainable as a missile test. Uh, one case in particular that's been reported previously here in the West was uh, witnesses who saw a UFO land on this frozen lake and take off. They left behind this large circular formation that kind of cut into the ice, sort of a Russian version of a crop circle, you know, cold evidence, cold hard evidence. That case remains uh, unexplained as far as Platov is concerned. Uh, he also mentioned that Russians have several of the traditional crop circle uh, crop type formations around the country but he had no files to give me on those he was generous enough to turn over several dozen of his case files to us including photographs he sums up his attitude by saying that science should be interested in pursuing the unexplained that the prospect for ET life is very important but we must follow the evidence where it leads not allow our research to be clouded by preconceived ideas whether pro or con that's the attitude of a true skeptic Не 
ребят здесь сформирует Новые модели со знамен идеально Выберет подтянутый строк Он несет свой кирпич к алтарю мироздания Экспериментатор движений вверх-вниз Видит просор там, где мнеется стена Он считает, что прав, он уверен в идее Он в каждом процессе достигает да! The next witness I want to talk about is Dr. Rem Verlamov. He's one of the founders of Russian ufology. He's currently teaching at the Moscow Institute of Technology. He's also the president of a ufologist union, very low-key group. Like Dr. Budakov, Dr. Verlamov agreed to talk to us only because we had skipped talking to all those other people, like Ajaja and, um, and Popovich. Uh, I have nothing against those folks, but they do get their names in the paper, and people like Verlamov and Budakov think they're just out to make some money. The fact we didn't talk to them allowed us to talk to him. Verlamov has specialized, go ahead and roll the tape, he specialized for nearly 30 years in the study of alleged UFO landing sites in Russia, including 10 that are in the direct vicinity of Moscow, and he's documented numerous impressive physical characteristics. The main the thrust site. of our work is not to contact the space intellect, but to understand how the universe works. We wanted to answer three questions. One, do other worlds and dimensions exist? We have measured 22 physical constants to suggest the answer is yes. Two, do our laws of physics exist in those worlds? No, they don't, and the differences can be documented. Three, can we contact this other intelligence? The answer is yes, but we must be careful. We discovered many measurable characteristics within the landing sites. The plans inside these circles or impressions were greatly changed. Plants which were inside the circles contained 20 to 30 percent more phosphorus and carbon and they grew at a slower rate. We studied 40 elements in the soil through spectrography. 20 of those elements were found in concentrations 20 to 60 times higher inside the circles than outside. Lead was found to be 14 times as concentrated. Titanium 8.5 times. Cobalt, barium, and zinc, three to four times. We also documented physical and psychological effects. Inside the circle, heart rates and blood flow were 60% higher. Our testing equipment also was affected at times. We conducted an experiment to see if the measurement of time might be affected by the energy inside the landing sites. We used both mechanical and crystal timepieces, which were synchronized then placed both inside and outside of the sites. 
What we found were that after two hours inside the landing sites, time speeded up. The timepieces were no longer synchronized. Verlamov, though, Dr. Verlamov is not alone in his study of these UFO landing sites. He says he and other scientists say the effects that he claims to have measured can be detected even years after the alleged landings take place so that you can go back and test it again and again and again. One of his most trusted colleagues, a man who is not known at all outside of Russia, is Dr. Yuri Simakov. I know it's kind of hard to keep all these names straight. It's hard for me, but this is the last one I think you'll have to deal with. Dr. Simakov is a government biologist employed at one of these long-winded, titled government research institutes. He has recognized some really amazing phenomenon inside these alleged UFO landing sites. Dr. Simakov specializes in measuring single-cell organisms in the soil. What he's found at these landing sites is this. There are none. No bugs in the dirt where UFOs set down. Two inches outside the landing site, the soil could be teeming with microscopic life. Inside the soil, it's the circle itself, nothing. Go ahead and roll this tape. The soil is simply barren, and by carefully sampling the soil at these sites, Simikov is able to determine the shape of whatever it was that sits, sets down. Uh, he can see that at this point, there's microscopic life. At this point, there isn't. So he's able to come up with these patterns of what, uh, what these things look like that set down. An even more intriguing discovery was made by Dr. Simikov at these two alleged landing sites, hundreds of miles apart and years removed from each other. What he found in the soil were these tiny, colorful balls of unknown origin. Neither Simikov nor any of his colleague could figure out what they were. He says they contained all the necessary building blocks of life, that when placed in water they opened up like seed pods, and he joked that they might be some sort of cosmic sperm. Here's him discussing his findings. The single cell organisms simply leave the sites. They disappear. They don't die. It's as if they were forced to leave the sites. We also experimented with insects. Insects have different receptors than we do. I suspect insects can feel fields not known to us or fields that are slightly varied. When we placed flies in a dish and put the dish over the landing site, the flies went wild, buzzing and flying around. The balls. I can't find any evidence of their existence in any printed material. They may be formed as a result of transmutation. When oxygen was transformed into sodium under the influence of the UFO. Or maybe they are containers to carry life from one planet to another. Still, the objects are not known. One more thing. At the spots where I found the balls, the flies we used in our experiments not only went wild, but were killed and mosquitoes could be found outside the landing site, but not inside. Although Dr. Simikov didn't have much of this material, he gave us a sample of it in hopes that American scientists that we might contact might be able to figure out what it is. Uh, I'll tell you that smuggling cosmic sperm through Russian customs is a somewhat daunting task, but we managed to get uh, half of the world's known supply of the stuff back to the United States for analysis. Um, at the suggestion of Dr. Jack Kasher of the University of Nebraska, we sent some of this stuff to the University of Nebraska Plant Pathology Lab, because Dr. Simikov, as you heard there, had speculated it acts like seed pods. According to Dr. Ann Vitiver of that lab, an interdisciplinary team examined and tested the material. The bottom line is, they don't know what it is either. Uh, they guessed at first that it might be some sort of an excretion or residue from plants or animals, but they ruled that out. They say it doesn't appear to be microbial at all, or it does not appear to act as a seed pod would. They further stated that it seems to have glass-like qualities, that it's very unusual, but the bottom line again, they can't identify it. A few weeks ago, I submitted a sample of this stuff to a physicist, Dr. Harry Fechter. He's a former chairman of the physics department at UNLV in Las Vegas. He's worked at Los Alamos Lab, summa cum laude, graduate of Stanford University in physics. He took a look at it under a microscope, examined it, speculated that he thought it looked like a byproduct of some sort of an, an industrial process that used high heat. However, he would not venture a guess about how such a material might end up in the dirt in soil samples separated by hundreds of miles out in the middle of nowhere, separated by years of time. The bottom line again, he didn't know what it was either. 
At his suggestion, we are now submitting a sample of this to an analysis firm in California. It's called Activation Analysis. It basically will tell you every atom that's in this stuff. Uh, I'm not sure that they, they say they cannot measure compounds, so I'm not sure that that's going to get to the bottom of it either. But at least it's the next step we're going to take, and I'll, I'll let you know what the results of uh, when I get them. CBS, by the way, is interested in going along when this testing takes place. A few other points about what Dr. Simbikov has been working on. He has no explanation for why single-cell organisms leave the soil when these UFOs or alleged UFOs land down. They have no natural enemies to speak of. He doesn't understand it. A second finding, a final finding that he had at these two UFO landing sites in Siberia, he found these microscopic worms in the soil around these alleged landing sites. The odd thing is these particular worms are native to Central America, Mexico, and they don't occur naturally in Russia at all. It's as if a UFO had touched down in Mexico perhaps to get a, a, a burrito or something for lunch and, and then decided to zip over to Siberia and set down there and... Uh, and it doesn't make any sense why those worms would be in the soil way out in the middle of Siberia, uh, but he's got the samples anyway. Very strange. But in the meantime, there are a lot of us, a lot of guys like myself, retired military, who are beginning to speak out about it. And I think the time has come. I think it's important that people know. So I've been active in, in UFO research for some time, ever since I... Uh, learned this information in 1964. So I'm sure they know about it, and I haven't been, you know, subtle about it. As I said, I'm still keeping a lot of secrets, and I still respect my security oath on practically every issue that I have ever sworn to. But this issue of the alien connection and the UFO matter is so important that really this the governments have got to stop lying to their people. One of the things that angers me here in the United States is that the, the taxpayers in this country are paying all the bills. And I'm not sure whether you know this or not, but we're paying $50 billion a year to black budget programs. And a lot of them are involved in the alien UFO connection. And I think that, that, that's got to stop. The, you see, what you have happening here is that you have people making national policy with $50 billion a year at their disposal. And what we've got here, whether we like it or not, is, is a government within a government. And I think the American people need to know that. You know, the average person hasn't the slightest idea what's been going on in Washington. We have policy being made by people who were never elected. They're not responsible. They're not accountable. Uh, there's no oversight. Congress doesn't know where the money is going. And the decisions are being made in this particular subject that are affecting the future of every man, woman, and child in this country. And damn it, that's too important to keep these people. I, I'm under the impression, or I have always believed, that this was supposed to be a republic. This is a democratic system. We have a constitution. Well, with this UFO matter, uh, we've got a whole bunch of guys back there who are absolutely ignoring the Constitution. And I think that's got to stop. Initially, the decision to keep the lid on this thing was a military decision. And of course, it was made right at the end of World War II. And we were in the middle of the Cold War. And probably the decision was a reasonable one at the time. But as they've learned more over the We've learned that we're not merely dealing with an extraterrestrial visitation here. This is not simply interplanetary visits. This is not simply extra, you know, interstellar or intergalactic. The, the latest developments that we have come up with, and I've talked to people who are inside the programs on this, who also feel as I do that they've got to be brought out, is we're dealing with intelligences out there that currently are multi-dimensional. And some of these intelligences apparently have the ability not only to manipulate matter, but they can manipulate time. Now, the subject in itself has such, such an impact, or would have an impact on the, 
the world view, the paradigm view of the average person of that if the whole truth were to be brought out, it literally would be earth shaking. Well, one of one of the subjects that will be uh, impacted probably the most with this new knowledge is the theological impact. The, the truth here is, is so incredible that it's going to have an impact on world religion. And that, I think, probably is one of the major single reasons why the government, and I say governments in plural, have determined to keep the lid on this thing for a while, at least until they can get people a little bit more educated. Can you imagine the impact of some of this knowledge that... Uh, well, might lead, lead, lead us to learn that the human race was perhaps seated on this planet. The human race has been genetically manipulated on this planet for hundreds of thousands of years. And how do you suspect the average man might respond to the idea that every major religion on this planet has its origin? somehow connected with this extraterrestrial connection. So I, I kind of understand to some degree the sensitivity of the subject and why those in power have decided that they just can't come out tomorrow morning on the national news and say, hey guys, have we got a story for you. This could be, oh, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a proper term, disturbing earth-shaking, the facts of this thing, when it all comes out, I believe literally will bring about a paradigm shift in the consciousness. Right? Over the edge raise you another UFO.
That's it for Over the Edge. Another UFO over Russia tonight. This is KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno. Over the Edge will return next Thursday at midnight with, I believe, the weatherman. And uh, stay tuned for puzzling evidence. To create is divine, to reproduce is human. Man Ray. Bye bye. Bye. The cat is in the mountain range, his bulging